Okay. So I present to you the Cybertruck. Doesn't look like anything else. Now hit the Cybertruck. Hit it ho- hit it harder. Oh my <laughs> god. Well, yeah. <laughs> Working. <laughs> Jeff who? And so began the rivalry between Elon and Jeff, one that would play out in the coming years throughout Cal Radio. Jeff Bezos was a mature, established workshop entrepreneur and owned all of Landia. Elon Musk was a fresh upstart, coming from a failed horse breeding venture called Tesla. The humiliation was unbearable, and he set out from Batania with only a thousand dinars and the shirt on his back. His goals? To become the wealthiest man in Cal Radio and put Jeff Bezos out of business for good. First things first, Elon needs to build up a base of wealth from which to work. Being young and impatient, he wants to kill two birds with one stone. So he set his sights on Jeff's daughter. Not only was she single, but she had all the trappings of a child born into wealth. Trappings which can be sold for a hefty sum. A marriage here would be the first blow in a series of many to the ego of clan Bezos. He set off to Pravind to begin the courtship. Not when gifted with words, he went right for the money shot. Apparently it worked as she accepted the proposal and they were wed the same day. Under the pretext of wanting to consummate the marriage as quickly as possible, they went right to the town shop and unclothed her. Sold off her belongings, her heirlooms, for a small fortune. 81,600 dinars to be exact. That same night, she became pregnant and was deposited in the tavern, naked and alone. With 80,000 in the bank, quite a few options have opened up. He could buy some workshops in hopes of competing with Bezos directly, but it would be impossible to compete with only a handful versus an entire kingdom. He could start his own caravan and travel Calradia in search of profits. It's here we take our first break from the story to investigate why trading is a horrible idea in the beginning of the game. Making profit is an easy equation. We buy for a low price and sell it somewhere else for a higher price. There's only one way to find out why trading in the early game sucks. We track the prices over time and graph them. We channel the powers of Santa Claus and travel to every single town in the game without unpausing in order to gather trade rumors from the same day. Once all towns were visited, we look at each item and mark down the prices. Then run the data through some basic statistics. Legit math not Tailworld's math. We repeat the process at day one, after one year, five years, and ten years to compare. Let's look at the most common good, grain. We'll remove the fancy stuff and look at pricing alone. The top orange line represent the highest price of the data set at each collection date. The middle blue line is the average price and the bottom purple line the lowest. As we can see, going from the start of the game to year one, prices drop by 56%. By year five, grain will only have reached 77% of its starting price. And by year 10, only 84%. If you were to buy grain from day one at the average price and hold onto it for 10 years, you would stand to lose 16% of your investment. While it's always possible to find a cheap deal somewhere and sell it for more elsewhere, even in a down market, it's not something that can be done at scale and is very risky. Let's add back in the previous data points. The dark blue column on the left represents how many trade rumors were present in the data set. The more trade rumors we have, the more accurate our average price will be. We can see only 28 towns out of the 53 in all of Calradia had grain in their inventory at the start of the game, which went down to 20 by year 10. The orange column is the standard deviation and represents how close the data set is to the average price. A small value means prices are close to the average, which makes for a very stable price, but less opportunity for a profit spread. We won't spend much time on variance, but essentially it describes how far price points are from each other. A large variance means much less stability in the pricing. It's important to note that variance is quite high on day one compared to the rest of the data, meaning pricing is all over the place. We won't go through every trade good in the game here because it'll take forever, but let's look at one more example to drive home the point. This is the graph for Velvet. If you're confused, don't worry. This is essentially Tailworld's math at its finest. Prices are way too unstable to trade at this stage. Looking at the pricing, we see things stabilize somewhat after a few years. If only they let us short these commodities. Now back to our story. It should be no surprise that trading wasn't in the cards for Elon. He needed something a bit more cheesy. No, not literally cheese. There's no profit in that. We're talking about smithing on a whole different scale. With his wife and three random strangers in tow, he headed to Ox Hall. I won't bore you with the details here, but it involves buying all the smeltable weapons in town, smelting them down, crafting a few two-handed swords to sell, and then finding a town to set up shop. The key, he says, is to find a place where crafting materials will sell for a lot of money. Gelland is that place. Crude iron is selling for 155% above the normal price. Then he sat outside the town gates waiting 
waiting for a caravan to come by. He pulled the caravan leader to the side and negotiated a deal with him. If you thought Elon would follow the rules, then you probably own a Tesla. The scheme is a bit like insurance fraud. We do not condone fraud of any kind. This video is strictly for entertainment purposes. Sorry, Gregory, I forgot about that. You can blame Hero and Lesser Scholar for finding this exploit. Basically, he sells everything but the most expensive crafting material to the trader. Ignore the trader not having enough money. That's his take. Then he sells the leftover crafting materials to the town. Then he buys the crafting materials back from the trader first, then the town after, and he's back to square one. But with one important difference. Those crafting materials bought from the trader now have an artificially low purchase price. When he sells them back to the trader, Tailworld's math thinks he actually made a profit, even though he's made a small loss, but picked up 100 trading levels in a single go. This process can be repeated up to level 300 trade without unpausing the game once. Thanks Tailworlds for not patching this exploit in well over a year. Hello, this is Future Strat. I wanted to give you a quick bonus. If you follow this exact process, you can reach well above level 300 trade skill with a single use of this tactic. We start at level 1 trade and only 2 attribute points and 5 focus points. If we were to save up all crafting materials for a few years, at least up to 3000 for each, which is easily doable for a trading and smithing run, then we can do this exploit in a single trade. As you can see here, we went from level 1 up to 396 within seconds. Simple as that. With level 300 trade in the rear view mirror, it was time to kick his criminal enterprise into full gear. Level 125 trade perk has two options. One giving renown for owning workshops and the other for caravans. At clan tier 0, he can only have one workshop, but he can have up to four caravans, three companions, and his naked wife. The choice was clear, as many caravans as he can have. We need to talk about perks briefly. There are a few that are important here for trade. Level 150 mercenary connections is key, but we'll cover that soon. 175 insurance plan is amazing since we're going caravan heavy. Each time we lose one, we get back 5,000, meaning our initial $15,000 investment actually costs us only 10,000. Level 250 spring of gold is the easiest money you'll make. If we keep a balance of 1 million dinars in the bank, we gain 1,000 per day for doing absolutely nothing. This is the most billionaire-like perk I can think of. Level 300 allows us to buy up fiefs, which we will need later as well. Okay, back to the story. With four caravans running, the money will soon be piling up, but Elon isn't one to sit on his laurels. He set off from Galland with 45,000 and an idea that had never been done through Calradia, not even Clan Bezos. He visited each town pretending to be a normal trader, buying up the best price goods and selling them elsewhere for a profit, all while secretly taking notes of what each town was producing and where they were getting their supplies from. Let's take a look at his notes. There are are 393 fiefs split into three categories, towns, castles, and villages. There are 67 castles in total, most of which have two bound villages and a couple having only one, for a total of 132 bound villages. However, castles have no production output and no market to sell things to, so these bound villages end up taking their goods to a different town. Speaking of towns, there are 53 in total, and each have between two to four bound villages and three workshops for production. Oddly enough, some towns have more than one of the same workshop type. Perhaps there's a lesson to be learned from Bezos, the master of the workshops? Let's look closer at Ostikan, which has two silversmiths and one tannery. According to the notes, Ostikan has three bound villages and one village from Turby Castle dropping resources off. Two villages bring fur, one horses, and one silver ore. This was puzzling. Why did Bezos double up on the silversmith and put a tannery when there are no animal farms to supply hides? Something wasn't quite right. Maybe it's a fluke. Let's look at Oxhall. The town has a wine press, brewery, and linen weavery, and has five trade-bound villages bringing in grain, grapes, flax, hardwood, and clay. Let's check the workshop almanac from 1083, the latest edition to see what each workshop actually needs to produce their output. Sure enough, the wine press uses grapes, the brewery uses grain, and the linen weavery uses flax. It seems like Jeff Bezos with all his money and fiefs can't optimize every single town in his kingdom, and there are opportunities to take advantage of this. However, Elon wasn't sold on the idea of copying Clan Bezos in hopes of catching up. He wanted total domination, which requires more innovation. So he set out to run some experiments to really understand what's going on behind those workshop doors. Why would Bezos set up a workshop in a town without the correct input? Here's the experiment.
experiment setup. Own Ostakin, go to war with everyone on the map to scare away caravans, and control the actual inputs in the town. Drain the town's inventory every day and see what shows up. The prosperity is set to 5,000 and the inventory is bought each day for 10 days. With nothing being dropped off from the outside, there should theoretically be nothing produced. However, each day some items were showing up. A melee weapon, a shield, javelin, helmet, and a shirt. Day two, we see similar results and a few items at the bottom that the villages dropped off. Day three was much the same, but the horse village showed up with their mounts. At the end of the 10 days, a total of 13 melee weapons, nine javelins, eight quivers of arrows, 10 different shields, and all sorts of low tier cloth and armor were present. All of this was made with zero input from the outside. How is this possible without any inputs or workshops? I won't bore you with the rigors of the testing, but here's a full list of what every single town in Calradia produces. Most things require an input to produce some sort of output, while a select few do not. Essentially, they create goods out of thin air. Garments, light armor, and low tier weapons, shields, and arrows can all be produced on their own, with no inputs. Some workshop only production is also passively produced in towns. If grapes are present, wine can still be made. If iron, hardwood, and leather are present in enough quantity, all tiers of weapons and armor can be made, even without a smithy. One important thing to note, any livestock in a town's shop will be slaughtered daily to produce meat and hides. This will be important to remember for later. In the name of science, let's look at two more experiments. If the prosperity is dropped to zero and then pushed up to 10,000, would there be a difference in production? Here is 10 days of melee weapons to compare. For zero prosperity, 15 weapons in total, compared to the 13 at 5,000 prosperity. Now we check 10,000 prosperity. Only seven melee weapons this time. Does that mean higher prosperity towns produce less goods? The short answer is no. Let's see the proof. We repeat the same test at zero and 10,000 prosperity and load the town up with 10,000 cows. At zero prosperity, a single cow was sliced up into six meat and two hides. At 10,000 prosperity, three cows were being taken each day, but only a couple pieces of meat were present and no hides, some of the time. There should be 18 meat and 6 hides if 3 cows were being butchered. Looking at the managed town screen, we find our answer. The higher a town's prosperity is, the more goods are taken from the inventory and consumed, turning them into prosperity gain. We see 2 cows, 6 meat, and 2 hides taken this time. But consumption can fluctuate day to day. This explains why weapon production decreased with an increase in prosperity. As the town grows, it will cannibalize the own goods that it produces. So if Clan Bezos had too many silversmiths in a single town, could the opposite also be true? What if no silversmiths existed on the map? What would happen to the price of silver ore and jewelry? There's only one way to find out. We Santa Claus our way around the map once more, buying every silversmith and converting it to something else, then selling it back to the town. Looking back at the town production data collected earlier, we can see all the towns that have a silversmith at the start of the game, making the list of stops we need to make much shorter. After everything is switched, we let a year's time pass and check the pricing from every town. Something interesting happened. Looking at silver ore, we would expect a huge price drop because there are no workshops to use up that supply. In reality, we see a slowing of the price increase, but the market for silver ore certainly has not crashed. Looking at the pricing for jewelry, we see exactly what we would expect. The price is stable for 10 years, steadily increasing from 241 at year one up to 443 by year 10. And in a single year, the average price skyrockets up to 2370. There was actually no pricing data here. I had to go around again and drop off a single piece of jewelry at each town to get data. But what effect does this have on workshops? To test, we buy a single workshop in Sanala without removing the other workshops from the map. Hold it for a year and then repeat it with all other silversmiths being removed. Income fluctuated between 200 and 450 and by the end of the year, a total of 2700 dinars were earned or 322 per day on average. After removing all the silversmiths, Smiths, the data seemed to start off the same, mostly two to 400 per day. But by the end of the first month, profits skyrocketed to 800 to 1200 per day. The same one year period ended with 68,000 dinars in the bank or 850 dinars per day on average. If we take out the first month's ramp up time, this average could easily reach 1000 per day. One thing to be aware of, if there are no workshops of a specific type on the map for long enough, Bezos will catch on and switch a workshop up. We can see the total workshop count here with no silversmiths, velvet weavery or smithies. After waiting one year, there was no change. But by year three, we see two smithies and one velvet weavery pop up. Clever girl. And by year four, 
five Velvet Weaveries and four Smithies are on the map. In a previous test, the AI had placed Silversmiths after a few years, so the changes seem to be based on the economy of the map at that point in time. There's still one thing unsolved. Why didn't the Silver Ore price drop after removing Silversmiths? For this, we need one final test before Elon can get back to spanking Clan Bezos. We repeat the previous test, but adjust the prosperity of the town where our workshop is. Starting with zero prosperity, we wait for a year and check the income. The daily price fluctuated between zero and 200 per day with a total income of 9,100 or about 108 per day on average. At 5,000 prosperity, the profit jumps up to 38,000 in total or 457 per day. And finally, for the memes, we test again at 100,000 prosperity and get 88,000 by the end or 1049 per day. Keep in mind, the previous 10,000 prosperity test ended with 68,815 per day. So there is a diminishing returns the higher prosperity goes up. But why does prosperity increase profits if the production is the same at all levels? One final test to show why. Seriously, this is the last one, I promise. These are the prices for Sanala at zero prosperity from the bottom of the goods section. Jewelry sells for 242, fur 239, and velvet 223. If we change the prosperity to 100,000, again, there's no difference in price. Yet. Let's let a few days pass and check it again. Holy sh Velvet is up to 1347 and fur to 653 and jewelry is sold out, can't find it anywhere. The reason there is price inflation over time in Bandalord is directly from prosperity. <laughs> a town with more prosperity will pay more for the same item than a lower prosperity town. Supply does have some effect as well. If both towns have the same amount of goods, the one with higher prosperity will always pay more and by a significant margin. This is the reason why silver ore increased in price. The increase in supply wasn't enough to drop prices to overtake the increase in prosperity over the whole of Calradia. Let's quickly do an overview of workshops in general and cover a few important facts that didn't make it into the previous analysis. There are three workshops per town available for purchase. Some workshop types are randomized and will be different with each campaign, but specific ones will always be the same such as silversmiths, smiths, and velvet weaveries. The purchase price is solely dependent upon the prosperity of the town, no matter how good or bad the workshop is doing. A workshop will produce an output as long as two factors are met. There needs to be the correct input good available in the town's inventory when the production cycle begins, which is usually the time of day that wages are paid out. And second, there needs to be enough profit to cover the workshop's expense after the output is produced. A workshop's profit is determined by the output's selling price at the time the goods are produced, minus the input's purchase price, minus the workshop's daily wage. The daily wage is 100 dinars by default, but can be lowered through perks. As your workshops earn a profit, the money goes into the current capital, the workshop's piggy bank. That piggy bank tries to remain at 10,000 dinars, so going under 10,000 means the income needs to be saved up before anything can be paid out to you, and anything over 10,000 will be paid out to you slowly, similar to the way mercenary income and influence works. This is the reason why workshops take a few days to a few weeks to start paying out the big bucks. They need time for the piggy bank to fill up. If you have a workshop that is making zero per day, either the town is out of input goods or the pricing isn't good enough to operate. Loyalty has no effect on the production cycle whatsoever. The higher a town's prosperity is, the more they will pay for goods. It's important to have a workshop in a town that has a high enough supply to operate, but even more important is to have it in a high prosperity town. To help ensure that your town has enough supply, you can capture castles that have bound villages producing goods that your workshop needs. If the villages are close enough to the town that your workshop is in, they will change the drop-off location and supply your town. If it's too far, they will stay locally. In order to maximize the profits your workshops are making, you can artificially create excess supply for the inputs and excess demand for the outputs by going around to each town, buying the workshops you wish to use for the long term, switch their production to something else, sell it back to the town, and then set up your operations in a high prosperity town. When the economy has lots of of supply, the workshop town doesn't need to have a direct supply, as all caravans on the map will be flush with that input that you need, allowing you the freedom to move away from specific towns. As time passes, the AI will start to change workshops around to fill the gaps, so be on the lookout to change them back from time to time. This typically happens on a time scale of two to four years. The bigger the gap, 
the faster they will change. Good options for workshop changing are breweries and tanneries, as grain and hides are in abundance around the map, so they will rarely go bankrupt and be swapped out by the AI. Good options for monopolies are those trade goods that are not passively produced by each town in the game. Beer, wine, oil, and tools, to name the big ones. You can manually help your workshops out by sitting in the town and either supplying cheap input goods, buying up the output goods to drive up the price, or both. For the silversmith workshops for my test, I was able to save up 100 silver and sell each one for 2,500 to 3,000 each, plus the 1,000 to 1,200 per day profit that the workshop was already producing. If you want to supply the towns with input goods, beware of dumping too many at once as that will attract caravans to come by and buy up the supply for cheap. And finally, you can get rid of your workshops in two ways. Sell it through this screen for roughly one third of what you bought it for, or go to war with the kingdom that is hosting your workshop. All right. Right, no more math, no more graphs, no more testing. Let's watch Elon crush Clan Bezos once and for all. Armed with this newly found knowledge. He set off around the map to switch all workshops producing jewelry, velvet, and smithies into other productions like tanneries and breweries. These workshops will still earn a profit no matter where they are on the map, making it much less likely that Bezos will switch the production back. Once everything is changed, he headed to the highest prosperity towns on the map, Sanala, Maranath, and Jacqueline in this case. He purchased one of each from Maranath and a velvet weaver and silversmith for both Sanala and Jacqueline. And since the renown was pouring in from the 125 trade perk, he hired even more caravans to run his expensive wares. While his workshops and caravans were piling up cash, he set off to start another company. He wasn't ready to give up on Tesla despite his earlier failures, so he went town to town rallying investors to buy his Calradia cryptocurrency, the Durthurt coin. The only ones crazy enough to invest were found in the tavern. After a year of campaigning, he recruited 310 investors who were paying him 459 dinars per day. But he could do better. By replacing the low tier investors with tier 5, he could increase the daily investment up to 758. Well, 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 Jeff Bezos himself sent Elon a personal invite to join his company. Looks like the first cracks are starting to form. In order to extract more cash from these investors, he will have to form a kingdom and start an army. Stuart Perk 100 gives an extra 25% wage discount, but only while in an army. This Sturgeon noble is hard up for cash since he's willing to sell his castle for 600,000. The worst case scenario here is having a war declared on him. So in order to avoid this, he must form the kingdom and quickly sell off the fief. Unfortunately, this noble has only 5,000 dinars and a couple animals on him, but it's going to have to do. With the army formed, the investors are now paying 1,700 per day, more than double from the previous amount. And finally, by finding a rebel town, he can start a siege camp and enjoy another 25% from level 250 steward, master of warcraft, bringing the total income from investors to 2,645 per day. And with enough food and stock, he can camp here as long as he wishes, without risk of being attacked since rebel clans are very weak. It's time to put the plan into full swing. The goal is now to find Vlandian nobles and purchase their fiefs. Castles are significantly cheaper and make easy targets to start with. Ormond was taken by the Batanians recently and should prove a nice bargain. Just over 1 million. That's a fair price. The castle is set to festival and games to keep loyalty up and the garrison was fired. Such is the life of a hostile takeover. Mergers and acquisitions is a brutal business. In order to avoid being attacked, the crown must be abdicated. PayPal is no more. Drappen Castle is purchased for 2.4 million and the same process repeats. Stop the building, start festival and games, fire the garrison, and the fief becomes a pure profit center. Considering he started with nothing and no money came from his family in South Africa to help start his many business ventures, Musk has done incredibly well. The workshops are still performing, caravans bring in plenty of profits, investors paying a daily wage, and the two castles all add up to 18,000 dinars per day of income. It's only a matter of time before Clans Bezos is dethroned and landless. And if there was any hope of reconciliation, it died with Elise. While leading a caravan, she was attacked by looters and took a rock to the face. Under the leadership of Clan Bezos, Vlandia has been in steep decline. These empire nobles want nothing to do with Sargo and sell it for under 500,000. Now Elon owns all Vlandian castles and the first Vlandian town. Akios was the new owner of Chadas, but seems to be in the mood to wheel and deal because he's letting go two towns and a castle for under 3 million. After years of strategic maneuvering and some shady deals, Elon has surrounded Jeff's final fief, Province. His landless board of directors run around the countryside doing their best to look busy for the boss, but without any fiefs of their own, there isn't much they can do. It's only a matter of time before they go bankrupt 
and abandon ship, leaving Bezos alone, dejected, and broke. With his mortal enemy out of the way, Elon bought the mansion of his dreams in the hills of Batania. Now the proud owner of Maranoth, he decided to spruce the place up a bit. All the amenities were already upgraded, so he personally hired and trained an OP governor to manage his estate, which nearly doubled his income, construction output, and even maxed out loyalty. If you want to build a governor just like Leah the Healer, click on this governor build guide right here. A huge shout out to all the channel members and Patreon supporters. I appreciate you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. We travel the path as Marini. Brewery. Marunath. Marunath. Marunath.